Hello, my name is Sawyer Brown. I'm a graduating senior at California State University San Marcos in spring of 2021, and welcome to my capstone project. My first piece today is a classical piece written by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it is from one of his cello suites. And there were six cello suites written on all different keys and the one I will be performing is uh, from the cello suite number one in G major, the minuets number one and number two. Now this piece was originally written for the cello and I am an electric bass player so I have had to make some modifications to figure out how to play this properly on my instrument. Well, to play it at all on my instrument. So there are some changes. If you hear a traditional version on a cello, my version is slightly different, but it is adapted for the bass. So please enjoy this first tune.
My second piece that I will be performing today out here in the garden is a traditional tune called Amazing Grace. And that's something that we all need a little bit more of these days, I feel. It's grace. And I have created my own arrangement for the bass, and I will be using advanced techniques uh, called harmonics, where I don't touch the string all the way down, I gently rest my finger on s certain spots of the string to get a higher pitched, a higher register note. Uh, and I will be playing the melody in harmonics and a bass line uh, with full fingering like a bass player would usually play. Uh, this has been a very challenging arrangement for me and I have enjoyed it thoroughly and I hope you do as well. The next piece that you will be listening to was recorded remotely uh, because of our space-time conundrum of 2020 and 2021 and the difficulties of getting together and playing with musicians. But I have collaborated with a good friend of mine named Andrew Galligan. He's a pianist that I used to play with back in community college. 
and we played in the vocal jazz ensemble and played two days a week for two hours and he's a good friend of mine and I like our chemistry and I asked him if he would accompany me with a piano track on a jazz standard called Monin. It was written by Bobby Timmons and made famous by Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. So here is our arrangement of Monin. Before we get to my final piece, I would like to give a 
couple shout outs and kudos to all of my professors um, and my instructors, Mac Layton, uh, my bass instructor, Justin Grinnell, a previous bass instructor of mine, Mel Melanie Grinnell, a uh, professor and director of the Grossmont College Vocal Jazz Ensemble. Uh, these people have influenced me tremendously and I wouldn't be here today without their assistance. But most of all, I would love to thank my family for the undying support in my ventures to play music. And I'd like to thank Cal State San Marcos for allowing me to study and have so much fun while I did it. It's such a wonderful school and I recommend it to students who are looking for a bachelor's degree in music. But my final piece will be something a little bit different than what we've heard so far. I will be using a program called VCV Rack, which is a modular synthesis emulator on the computer. And there will be lots of wires and lots of knobs. It's going to look like a bird's nest. But I encourage you to sit back and enjoy the song. This track is called In the Garden.
Hi, my name is Elizabeth Hoff. I studied classical music throughout my years at Cal State San Marcos, and I have a huge interest in music theory and analysis. For my final capstone, I decided to pick a piano piece to play and analyze. This piece is by Beethoven, called Sex Variationen, which translates to six variations. In total, it has seven parts and is six pages long. Because this piece is so lengthy, there's quite a lot to analyze, but also has some interesting history behind it. Theme and variation pieces are unique because of how they fit together. Sometimes they don't sound similar, but after taking a closer look, you can see different patterns, techniques, notes, phrases, etc. that make them all related to each other. To start off, we need to know who Beethoven was. Born in 1770, he lived through the end of the classical era and through the transition to the Romantic period, which had a huge impact on his composition style. Most people would recognize who Beethoven is, or at least have heard his name before. Some of his most famous pieces include Moonlight Sonata and Symphony No. 5, which can be identified by just a couple notes. For this particular piece, Beethoven used the theme from an opera nicknamed The Miller Woman, performed in 1788. The original song is called Nel Corpio Non Mi Santo and had a string accompaniment along with the vocalist. Other composers during this time used the same theme to create their own variations but used different instruments, including guitar, violin, flute, and piano. Here's a short video of the original theme with an opera singer accompanying. <laughs> Beethoven's variations. He composed and first performed this piece in 1795, which is still pretty early on in his career. During this time, he also performed piano sonatas number one through three and piano concerto number one and two. The piece was formally published in 1796 in Vienna, right before he started to travel to perform some more. He also managed to compose four other variation pieces that were published also in Vienna. Three of these were based on operas. It was common for composers to take an existing, almost like a popular theme from another work and turn it into a theme and variation piece. I like to think of this almost as taking a familiar song and making a remix. It is something familiar to the public, but with a new twist. Written and performed during the classical era, this piece has very few dynamic markings. The performer then has to think of how the pieces were performed in general during this time period. It was common for ascending notes going up to get louder, when we go down, the descending notes get softer. There's also a lot of flexibility and dynamics depending on the musician's personal style and interpretation. So what key are we in? This work is written in G major. We use Roman numerals to discuss chords within the key we're in. G major is our home key, represented by capital Roman numeral one. Capital numerals are major chords. They're sounding more happy. And minor chords are lowercase. They sound a little bit more sad. The fifth of a scale is called the dominant. The dominant of G is D. The 
5 recurs a lot in this piece, mostly marked by a fermata. Using a 5 chord in place of a 1 chord occurs frequently and also marks certain points within the piece. Let's get into the piece. Written in G major, it also has a time signature of 6-8, just like the original song from the opera. Each section, regardless if it is the initial theme or a variation, follows a certain pattern. The first eight measures of the section is the variation of the theme. After that, there is a brief developmental section. The final four measures of the theme are the same as the last four measures in the variation of the theme. It sounds a little confusing, but after hearing the pattern a few times, it will be easier to pick up. The initial theme starts off on a D note, and the right hand followed immediately by a B. The theme is in G major, and then the developmental section happens. We have some accidentals, which make it almost sound like A minor, which is the minor 2 of G. Then we have a small section in the dominant, which is D. There is a half cadence at measure 14 marked by a fermata, which means to hold the notes or notes longer than the written duration, mainly for dramatic effect. A half cadence ends a certain phrase in a piece, but doesn't resolve or feel complete yet, hinting that there is more to come. The very end of our piece finishes with a perfect cadence, which is a G chord. Perfect cadence is like a resolved half cadence. There are two parts to make a perfect cadence, a five and then a one. This occurs in almost every variation to follow. Variation one is a little different than the theme. Instead of a calm and smooth feel, we now have 16th notes that pick up the pace. The variation as a whole feels like an embellished version of the theme. There's a new dynamic marking introduced called a sforzando in measure five, but it also appears in other variations. This particular variation follows a scalar pattern for the majority. Chromatic scales are introduced, but reappear later on. Measure 14 marks our half cadence once again with the fermata and a perfect cadence at the end. The second variation is somewhat similar to the first, but has some key differences. The repetition of 16th notes comes back, but this time are played by the left hand rather than carried on with the right. The flow of the 16th notes creates an easy flow and makes it easier to play. An interesting technique in this piece is the jumps by the right hand, which are the same pattern used by the left hand in the first variation, but it's flipped. This is a technique called melodic inversion and is used to create continuity between a theme and a variation. Our dominant five returns with this fermata in measure 14 for a half cadence, and we again end with a perfect cadence and a final G chord. Variation three is different than the first two. Instead of constant 16th notes, we now have arpeggiated chords, think broken up. 
with 16th and 8th notes instead of constant 16th notes. This variation was more difficult than variation two. The movement arpeggios move around the keys and the notes aren't right next to each other. Maintaining a smooth flow is a little bit harder, but it creates a different feel. The sforzando from variation one reappears, accenting the chord changes included in the arpeggios. Both cadences reappear right where we expect them to be. Variation 4 gives us something new to hear. We are now in the key of G minor instead of major. This section feels ominous and almost sad, unlike the first couple quick and cheery variations. G minor is a parallel minor. It uses the same key signature as B flat major, but is not included in the G scale. G minor is parallel to G major due to them both sharing the same tonic, which is G, our starting note of the G scale. Our ear might expect to hear E minor due to the fact that it shares the same key signature as our home key. Beethoven's choice to use the parallel minor in this variation was a common technique used in theme variation pieces during the classical period. No other section changes keys, which keeps this variation unique and stands alone. Instead of having our familiar half cadence, our cadence in measure 14 is now an imperfect cadence. The end of the phrase finishes off with a major G chord in our original key. The perfect cadence remains at the end, our last chord being the G minor. The fifth variation returns us to our home key of G major. The chromatic scales return from the first variation. Chromatic scales differ from other scales. Chromatic scales include every note from the start to end. Picture a piano. Playing a C scale, we start on C and move it to the next C, hitting all the white keys in the scale. C, D, E, F, and so on. If we were to play a chromatic scale starting on C, we would hit the white and the black keys in between while moving up the scale. C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, G, G sharp, and so on. This section has a new pattern of repeating triplets throughout the variation. Triplets have a different count than other notes, which can be heard compared to the other variations. We return back to our perfect cadence at the very end and our half cadence in measure 14.
moving on to the last variation. Variation six is different than all the rest. Pictured here is variation three. This variation is short, about half a page long, but written in a complex and challenging way. Variation six is not just half a page. Variation six is two whole pages long. The combined movements of the left and right hand prove to be even more challenging than the other movements. Both hands moving at the same time was suggested. Why do I keep doing that? <clears throat> moving on to the last variation. Variation six is different than all the rest. Pictured here is variation three. This variation is short, just about half a page long, but written in a complex and challenging way. Variation six, however, is not just half a page. Variation six is two whole pages long. The combined movements of the left and right hand prove to be even more challenging than the other movements. Both hands moving at the same time, but different intervals, was one of my biggest challenges while playing this piece. Due to that, I've broken it up in sections to discuss key phrases and changes. Overall, the structure of the piece is relatively simple. Our half cadence appears in its usual spot, keeping up the same format as the other variations. The synchronized movements in the right and left hand keep an easy flow, but the notes differ. The note on the beat in the right hand carries the melody. This is a variation of the original theme, just a little bit more embellished. This variation is much longer and doesn't follow the pattern of the eight note variation of the theme. Up to measure 14 with the fermata is our theme variation. The developmental section lasts up until measure 32, over double the length of the theme variation. The last 16 measures keep a consistent G note in the left hand, our bass note. The first section is all 16th notes. There are no rests or other note durations until the end of the section with the fermata on a dotted quarter note. Right hand starts on D and moves to B, just like the theme again. Some accidentals are thrown in starting on measure three, creating a new feel out of our home key of G. This next section was more challenging to play as a musician. It felt long to play due to the new sound as the variation develops. About halfway through, the left hand jumps up to the treble clef, where the right hand usually is, and the right hand is a bass clef, where the left hand usually is. This new change is a little challenging to play due to crossed arms and is a little uncomfortable, but doesn't last very long. The first five measures of this section continue the same pattern from the first section, but transition into our new developmental section. When the left hand moves up to the treble clef, it briefly has some clashes with the right hand with second intervals and minor second intervals. Left hand then starts with octaves after being in the treble clef and right hand carries the melody once more.
last section takes us to a new feel for the first half. Right hand brings in octaves, while the left hand plays arpeggios on 16th notes for the remainder of the variation. The sforzando marking returns from the first variation in the right hand to accent the G note and remind us of our home key. The left hand keeps a constant G note for the remaining 12 measures of the variation. For our ending, we end with a perfect authentic cadence. The G note is in the highest voice in the right hand and in the bass. The chord is arpeggiated in the previous measure to hint at our ending. This variation is definitely a Beethoven move. It's exaggerative and over the top, making a final scene right before the piece ends. Theme and variation pieces sound beautiful and sometimes simple, but taking a closer look allows us to see how much work and creativity is behind them. Having little highlights within the score that relate to a previous theme or variation throughout the entire composition is a great way to keep everything consistent and familiar. It's like finding little hidden Easter eggs in a movie. Learning the history behind the piece can be just as interesting as playing it and allows the musician to have a better appreciation of what the score represents. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Lehman and this is my senior capstone project for Cal State San Marcos. I am joined today by two lovely musicians who I met through CSUSM and have graciously helped me through the process of putting this whole thing together. On the piano we have Alexis Marin and on the guitar and ukulele we have Mari Karin. The first piece we have for you today is by an artist who inspired me to do music. Without her, I don't know if I would be graduating with my bachelor's degree in music in less than five weeks. The song I chose is my favorite lyrical and melodic masterpiece of her catalog. This is Cardigan by Taylor Swift. Vintage tea, brand new phone, high heels on, cobblestones. When you are young, they assume you know nothing. Sequin smile, black lipstick. Thank you. 
was all we needed. You drew stars around my scars, but now I'm bleeding. For my second piece, I decided to perform an original song that I had the amazing opportunity to record over a year ago under my artist name, Isla. When I wrote the song, I was definitely in a completely different headspace than I am now. This is called Could Be.
For my third piece, I wanted to do a tribute to my family from and in Hawaii. The Hawaiian culture is new to me, but it is so beautiful. Many artists have covered Aloha Oe, but I found a beautiful simplicity in Nani's version. The following is a translation to the song. Proudly swept the rain by the cliffs as it glided through the trees, still following ever the bud, the ahihi lehua of the veil. Farewell to you, the charming one who dwells in the shaded bowers, one fond embrace ere I depart until we meet again. Ha heyo ka uaina pali ke nihi a ela i kana hele e hai hai ana pa hai kali go pua ahi piece, I'm covering another powerful female artist who inspires me every day to push my vocals and produce my own music. The song highlights how excited I am about my future after I graduate. This is My Future by Billie Eilish. I can't seem to focus and you don't seem to notice I'm not here. I'm just a Check your complexion to find your reflections all alone. I had to go. Can't you hear me? I'm not coming home. Do you understand? I've changed my plans Cause I, I'm in love With my future Can't wait to meet her And I, I'm in love But not with to know myself one two three four i know supposedly i'm lonely now no i'm supposed to be unhappy without someone but aren't i someone Cause 
but not with anybody here. I'll see you in a couple years. Hey everyone, you are now entering the classical slash Broadway section of my capstone project entitled The Pivotal Melodies of My Life. I chose this title because each piece was a moment where something changed for the better. The following pieces represent my classical training I received throughout college with Professor Melisha Taylor and Professor John Craig Johnson. Today I'm joined with Professor Dana Burnett who graciously agreed to play piano on these pieces and direct all the capstones. I hope you enjoy. The first classical piece I will be performing is entitled La Mi Sola Laureola, composed by Fernando J. Obradores. This piece was the first piece that made me realize, wow, I can actually sing classical solos. The following is a translation. My only laureola, my only one, I captive Leriano am very proud to be wounded by the hand which is unique in the world. My only laureola, my only one. last Broadway piece I will be performing for you is entitled The Light in the Piazza from the Broadway musical The Light in the Piazza composed by Adam Gutel. This is easily the hardest piece I have learned in my catalog and it made me realize how far that hopeful girl in middle school show choir has come. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> 